thank you guys for coming here this awful weather. Um, our first speaker, as you know, was Manus. Uh, he went to the top man. So, pretty interesting talk, so I'll let you go on. All right. Hey guys, my name is Manas. Uh, I work at the Combustion Lab uh, here at Georgia Tech, and my advisor is Dr. Menon, and I'll be presenting on the experimental studies of similar decomposition in vitiated hot cross. Let's get started. So I'm just going to go through a quick table of contents of what we'll be seeing in this presentation. I'm going to go through a quick introduction uh, and then a background, and the background is going to show, serve as mainly a digest of what we're going to see and what we see in the presentation, as well as kind of giving us an in-depth look at um, everything that's going to be digging apart into what the actual actual research and what the actual experiment is going to be uh, talking about. After this, I'm going to go into our objectives of the experiment, uh, of the research. Um, and after this, I'll be showing a schematic and model. Uh, this research is very, very preliminary. It started up this semester. So the schematic and model is very, is uh, all a design plan. Uh, nothing's actually been implemented yet, and it's in, in route to be implemented soon. Um, after this, we go into future challenges and, and goals, as well as current progress of the, uh, of the experiment and the project. And lastly, I'll be going to my own, my own personal stake and importance of this. All right, let's get started. So, um, to talk about the purpose of this experiment, chemical warfare agents have been a topic of wide interest recently, especially with the current political situation, as well as the necessity to have and counter these chemical uh, uh, weapons and weapons of mass destruction. And um, incineration and decomposition of these toxic toxins is crucial to better understand how to dispose of these into an environment as well as to provide a better understanding of how to deal with them if they're ever released into the room. Um, organophosphorus compounds such as DIMP or di, um, diisopropyl methyl phosphonate, uh, they act as simulants for these dangerous chemical warfare uh, toxins uh, in, in, uh, in such is uh, sarin gas. And so uh, basically the research boils down to characterizing and predicting physical and chemical effects of stimulants in a turbulent environment. And the way we'll be doing this is through a high temperature mixing tunnel. Uh, there will be a vitiator slash a burner at the upstream um, uh, section of the test rig. Uh, and this will feed air into a turbulence generation grid, which will create that turbulent environment that we're desiring for our experiment. Uh, after this, there will be a simulate injection. And uh, the simulate, as of right now, will not only just be DIMP, but it would also be air, argon, and carbon dioxide for initial testing before we use DIMP, just because DIMP is very expensive. And um, we need to first get the concentration of how much we want to use before we can actually uh, carry through with that experiment. Uh, and lastly, there, uh, there will also be LDV and PIV techniques measure uh, the flow in the test section through uh, water-cooled windows. Uh, and this will allow us to uh, get an accurate measurement of the flow velocity as well as the temperature uh, in those sections. Now to go into some background about these uh, chemical toxins. Um, there's been a lot of renewed interest in the environmental fate of electrical weapons, or um, chemical weapons, like that. Uh, and this comes from an intensified threat of chemical warfare and terrorist attacks. Um, and it's always uh, important to be prepared and have that uh, extra sense of research and, um, and knowledge and understanding how to deal with these situations if ever arises. And one such gas that, and one such toxin that we'll be uh, investigating in this research is sarin gas, uh, also called GB. Uh, sarin is highly toxic uh, nerve agent. It's clear, colorless, tasteless. It's a man-made liquid, it's a man-made toxin, uh, and it's the most volatile of all the G agents out there, uh, which means it um, uh, evaporates into the, uh, into the atmosphere and the air much easier than all the, any, uh, any other, other G agents, which makes it more reactive and more dangerous in, as, uh, as people inhale it in uh, certain scenarios. And it also inhibits an enzyme in the body called acetylcholinesterase, which is an enzyme that's responsible for um, basically the off switch in our body for muscles and glands. So without this enzyme functioning, uh, what sarin gas does, it makes uh, our body stimu like stimulate to any sort of um, outside stimulus, which makes it uh, difficult breathing. It can make it uh, prone to seizures and also um, a lot of other lethal uh, consequences. To go into now the background about the stimulants themselves, uh, chemical warfare agents are far, far too toxic to be experimented on in uh, the lab uh, by themselves. And their use in labs is pretty much restricted for, for the most case. Um, so our best alternative is to use organophosphorus stimulant compounds, which we talked about, which is DIMP, uh, which are much, much less toxic, and have, but they still have very similar uh, combustion chemistry, which allows us to experiment on and still um, analyze those results and extract those results for the actual um, uh, chemical agents. Uh, and the, uh, the stimulant in question that we'll be using for this uh, our research, for the entire research, is diisopropyl methyl phosphonate, otherwise known as DIMP. 
Uh, it's a chemical byproduct of um, the manufacture of sarin gas, which makes it very uh, similar to sarin gas and is also a, a very viable solution to as an alternative for sarin, uh, using sarin gas. Uh, it's a, also a clear colorless liquid and it's not very volatile and not very reactive, so it's very much much safer. Uh, if um, DIMP ever gets on someone's a human skin, the most they'll ever do is cause a rash, um, but it's not lethal, which is definitely the best way to uh, experiment on these results. So and now I'm just going to go into the kind of the structure of these um, two uh, compounds very uh, briefly. Uh, so sarin gas on the left and uh, DIMP on the right. Um, you can see how both of them have that isopropyl uh, methyl group, and also they both have um, a P double bond to O, um, and the central atom is uh, uh, is bonded to uh, very electronegative atoms, which makes it uh, more reactive. Um, and just looking at the two structures, you can see how they're both very similar, and now uh, DIMP can definitely be used as a viable signaling for sarin. Now going to more of the objectives of our actual research now. So our objective is to obtain a cross flow temperature upstream of the DIMP uh, injection site, as well as to quantify heat losses that's going to be happening throughout the test, uh, the test section and the, and the test rig. Um, we want to simulate, use simulant injection for a, a variety of different gases before we use DIMP, as I talked about earlier, such as air, argon, and carbon dioxide. Uh, and we want to do this before just so we understand that the experiment works, the vitiator works, and all the components of the entire test rig works before we use the expensive and um, slightly more dangerous uh, DIMP compound. Um, and we were, using, we were doing this all through uh, assessing the flow field um, through water cool windows using LDV and PIV diagnostics. Uh, and they must be water cooled so then there's no, we minimize heat losses as well as we make sure the LDV and PIV measurements are accurate. Uh, continuing with our objectives, we want to also verify inflow of turbulence upstream of stimulant injection. Uh, and we want to also vary that stimulant injection angle uh, and also the test session length because um, we want to study the turbulent mixing and resonance time effects on dip kinetics based on the, the angle as well as how, how, many, how much time they have in that test section to actually react and uh, deco decompose. Uh, so mainly this data is going to be used for validation under high temperature conditions. And um, this code validation is important because it allows us to uh, push forward an agenda for more realistic studies in the future. Right, because this serves them as a good basis and understanding for what um, uh, what uh, this experiment can uh, pose for uh, chemical warfare and everything like that. But we want to make sure that we can also replicate these results and future uh, and extend these results to future studies. And this is just a past demonstration of the vitiator in work. This is not actually not the entire test session. This is just the vitiator in work. Um, uh, you can see here how we use actually a quartz tube. A quartz tube is that, is that glass tube up there, uh, like that clearly looking tube. Uh, and we use this instead just for a initial visit, visualization of the vitiator and making sure it works. Um, and uh, the entire rig is not uh, completed in, this, in, this, in these images just because uh, some of the rig was taken down because of structural and vibrational issues, which is why we're starting the, gra starting the project from the ground up, um, because we need to um, uh, Re reinstall those those parts for the rig, um, but in reality, the vitiator actually be used uh, will actually be inside a ceramic tube instead of a quartz tube, uh, and it will be well insulated within test section to minimize heat. Loss. And all this talk about vitiators, and um, I guess we can go into what actually is a vit vitiator, right? And so vitiation refers to when the oxygen concentration in air is reduced to the due to the mixing of dilution gas, and that dilution, and those dilution gases can be uh, nitrogen gas, it can be carbon dioxide, it can be uh, water vapor, um, and Vitiators, vitiators can pretty much be thought of as a burner that's upstream, uh, and vitiation is achieved through the recirculation of uh, exhaust gas in the stage combustion system, as you can see in the images uh, in the image below. This is there we go, <laughs> the image there, uh, and this is going to preheat the air as it ent enters the turbulent turbulence uh, generation grid uh, injection site and eventually into the test. So this is just a schematic of the entire uh, rig, entire um, uh, test rig. Again, uh, nothing actually been built. It's just a model of it, uh, so we know how, what, where we want everything to be, and also just gives us the idea of how everything's going to be for the concept-wise. Uh, as you can see, um, the vitiator, burner, and combustion section is upstream, and right after that, we have a flow conditioning section, which uh, will uh, get the, will transition the flow from a circular flow from the vitiator to a more square flow uh, into the test section. After this, will be uh, there will be a um, There'll be turbulence generation grids, which will create that turbulent environment that we that we want to carry the simulant into our test section. 
right? And then right after that, we have the simulated injection site. This is where uh, we'll be injecting either the DIMP, the air, the argon, or the carbon dioxide um, for our tests. Uh, throughout this section, there will most likely be a heater. Uh, I'll be talking about this a little later, too. Um, this, this is just to make sure the temperature stays constant, as well as to increase it from the 300 Kelvin that we have for preheated air to around 400, 500, 600 Kelvin that we have for uh, the test section. Uh, and then in the green little sections you see up there, you can see that those are the water-cooled windows. Um, they will be uh, the windows for optical access for the LDD and PID instruments. Moving on, we're going to go talk about the tunnel, tunnel, tunnel test section themselves. Uh, and so the test section consists of six total layers of materials, and this is still not created. This is a, a plan to be fabricated, but this is the idea and the concept for how it's going to be uh, fabricated. Um, the first layer, the internal layer, will be alumina flow channel, uh, and this will most likely be cast or machined. Um, it's pretty simple uh, in that sense. Um, after that, the second layer will be a fused silica foam. Uh, it's also machinable, and it's most likely going to be a ceramic layer. Um, on that outer edge, you have a molded alumina fiber, which is four layers of aluminum fiber, uh, alumina fiber, fiber before the fourth layer, which is a liner that kind of holds all that, those components together, right? On the outside of that, you have a large um, section of uh, microfiber ceramic board to help with installation, uh, help with structure, and then lastly on the outside, you have a carbon steel casing. So you can just put everything together. Uh, now, we talked about those cool windows before. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more in depth in them. Uh, these windows are mainly used for LDV and PIV measurements, which are LDV is uh, laser uh, measurements and PIV is uh, camera measurements. Um, and these frames must be cooled, it must be water cooled uh, in order to make sure we don't uh, have heat losses, as well as making sure that um, the uh, equipment such as the LED and the PIV are able to measure accurately without any uh, disturbances and without any uh, issues there. Uh, so the way they'll be manufactured is through layered brazed um, Inconel plates uh, with cooling channels. And Inc Inconel is essentially a stronger version of uh, stainless steel. It's, uh, I think it's a nickel chromium uh, super alloy. Um, and these these windows will actually be inside and outside. So you'll have uh, an inside window and outside window and make sure you have that gas seal. And um, I guess you can look at this image on the, on the right too. And uh, you can see how um, that window is actually a quartz window and uh, you have those water cooling make sure that the entire system is cooled through those two cooling channels. Uh, going to the DIMP injection system, uh, um, just a preface that the DIMP injection just doesn't mean that it's only going to inject it DIMP uh, the compound. It's also going to be uh, tested first for carbon dioxide, for argon, um, and for air. Um, but this is just the system name. It's just uh, what we're calling it because it, eventually it's going to be called the, the uh, DIMP injection system. Uh, the reason we can't test with DIMP right now is because the concentration of DIMP is, uh, the vaporized DIMP is unknown at this time. We don't know how much we need. We don't know how much uh, it costs yet. And um, we don't know how much um, we want to use for the experiment based on our previous results. So that's why our focus right now is to use carbon dioxide and argon right now and get uh, a gas injection for around 10 grams per second of mass flow rate. And we want to get to like a max delivery pressure around 12 atmosphere. Um, and these two gases will be supplied to the vaporizer and they'll also be preheated. Um, and also, I talked about previously that possible use of a, pre uh, of a heater to make sure the gas approach temperature is constant and also can increase based on where we want to have the um, temperature at in the test section. Uh, more about the injection itself, about the assembly, the, uh, the DIMP injection assembly itself. Uh, there will be a thermocouple at the injector plate plenum uh, to capture the DIMP vapor temperature. Um, and the injector plate will be, uh, is planned to be water cooled again to make sure we uh, minimize heat losses. Um, and the injector plate will be uh, fabricated using uh, braze 3 printing, uh, and braze just means it's a process of how, how we put it together, uh, and um, uh, Inconel 625 parts, which again is that nickel chromium uh, super alloy that will be used. And again on the right you can see uh, at the top we have where the, the exit, I guess the nozzle of the uh, injector is angled, it can be angled up at 135 degrees. Uh, and that's one of our objectives because we want to make sure that we can vary that angle as well as the test section length to see if uh, that changes how um, the flow reacts, how the, uh, the particles react, and if that changes the kinetics of the dim, car of dim, of the dim compound. So now I'm just going to go into some current progress that's actually being done for this experiment right now. All this we talked about previously was the plan for it, what's the concept. Again, this is very initial. Um, so the current progress that's actually being done right now is 
the ceramic text section that I talked about that we want to fabricate for the, uh, for the text section is on hold right now because of the structural issues we had with the rig. Um, uh, there's a there's a lot of vibration and um, structural issues that happen when we run the rig for the first time uh, previously last year. So we want to make sure we man remanufacture all the parts that we need and uh, and basically get the rig first uh, sound and making sure it's running well before we have any other manufacturing parts for the ceramic text section, the cold windows or for the injection. Um, we want to also we're trying to get heaters to sustain the, sustain and increase the temperature from the preheated air as well as to, through the test section. Um, so these are some calculations that I worked on and sent to uh, Dr. Menon. Uh, and basically the entire aspect of it is we want to fabricate a new test rig, a new um, um, new test frame. And that's our current uh, goal right now, current focus right now. Um, the parts actually just arrived in the machine shop a couple days ago. So uh, I'll be working with that and making sure that um, uh, the designs are correct and everything, and then we can get those machined out. Uh, and basically, overcome the challenges of the old rig with the vibration and structural issues and hopefully have a new system that's more sound, more stable, and we can start getting more products done with the actual. Our future exact objectives with this mission, uh, with this uh, um, this uh, experiment, is to first figure out if the concentration dip actually uh, needed to be injected. And this, this comes from just testing with the other gases, the, uh, the, uh, the carbon dioxide, the argon, the air. Um, and then also another objective is to create that ceramic test section that we talked about. Um, we want to also uh, create those cooled uh, injector plates as well as the water cooled window frames to make sure that when we're taking measurements that we don't have any biases, we don't have any issues, we're taking measures just because of the heat losses um, in the, uh, throughout the windows. Uh, right, as of right now, the test session we have is a stainless steel test session, um, which is not ideal because it, is, um, it does have uh, heat losses and it enables heat to escape, um, but we're just using this just to test the vitiator and make sure it works. Uh, and we want to use this to collect more gas, temp gas, gas concentration um, values as well as temperature data. Uh, and lastly, we want to, soon in the near future, we want to test the injection system with around five kilograms, uh, five grams per second of mass flow of carbon dioxide. And um, that's our hope to get done by the end of the semester. So now going more into my personal interest and motivation into this research, I was always intrigued by the combustion field, and I think the ability to start on a ground up project is very rewarding. And in addition, the application of this research and data is essential to better our understanding of uh, weapons of mass destruction of the chemical, war chemical warfare and also mitigation procedures for how to deal with this if this ever happens in our environment, if it ever happens uh, in our country. Um, and it's, it's definitely a topic of, of, uh, of in interest to look into and make sure that we have, we have procedures and also just research to understand these, these uh, chemical weapons um, for the future. And in conclusion, again, this is a largely a work in progress. Uh, it's very interesting applications of combustion chemistry to very prevalent scenarios that um, are, are talk, talked about in the world through news, through political climate. Uh, and the hope is after all this research, after all the experiment, that we can provide crucial data to predict, plan, and prevent any future chemical threats that uh, could harm our potential world. And with that, uh, thank you. Yes, if you have any questions. How does the like reduced volatility of dip affect the results that you get? How can you scale up the map? So like how would we know how much concentration we need? Yeah, like how do you like how does the data you get from these dip versus right? So um because the two compounds are very similar, uh essentially we can uh, they have very similar reaction rates as well as very similar uh, like uh, combustion chemistry so whatever results we get from dip eventually once we have the concentration dip once we have uh, dip like in use and actually running through the through the test rig through the vitiator and everything through the test uh, through the stimulant injection um, where we can pretty easily extrapolate those results to sarin because they are pretty much the exact same compound uh, dip is actually is a byproduct of sarin gas so um, uh, their combustion chemistry, their reaction rates are very similar. So those, that, that's the main reason why we're actually using stimulants, is because they're they're safer, but also they allow us to replicate the results to a very accurate degree. Yeah. Uh, so it would be. It's it's like uh, around this 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 table. Yeah, that's pretty long. Yeah. Um, do you know what kind of pressures? 
Uh, I don't think as of right now, because we I'm not sure what the previous rig was running at, but because we're designing a new rig, right. uh, I think the pressures would change just a little bit. Um, yeah. So I'm not. And the temperature is around like 500. Yeah. So um, the exhaust temperature we're gonna have is around uh, 1750 Kelvin, um, but uh, preheated in the vitiator it's gonna be around 300 Kelvin, uh, and then we're thinking of having a heater to get the test section around 300, 400, 500. 600 Kelvin in that okay. just that test section test section rate. Um, I'm just I'm just curious. But yeah. So you're going to inject uh, argon, CO2, and a bunch of other gases in sort right. of way that the simulated right. cycles, right? What's the purpose of injecting those gases as opposed to starting with just the dimp? And right, because dimp is very expensive right now, uh, and um, we don't want to use the amount of dimp we don't know how it actually reacts with. Uh, so we wouldn't inject argon uh, air and Carbon dioxide at the same time, which would be like one test at a time, right? So as of right now, we're talking to Dr. Menon, our first priority is just get carbon dioxide running. Um, so once we get the rig kind of put together and everything's kind of working, I think we'll most likely stick with the stainless steel test section for now before we can manufacture the ceramic one. Right. Uh, and just test it with the um, dioxide and just see how it runs first. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually a dilution gas injection. Um, I think you can see in this right here. Um, we're not, we haven't finalized what that dilution gas is, um, but once we do, I think um, it should be, that, that's where it's going to be injected for the particles. For the, yeah, the end of that. Okay, I guess we'll thank you. All good? Okay. All right, so I was going to start by saying um, I was sick a little bit earlier this week, did not test positive for COVID, got a couple negative tests, and I'm feeling much better, but I woke up today with no voice, so I apologize for that. Let me know if you can't hear me at any given time. Um, my name is Alex Mealy. Thank you for coming to my brown bag. Um, uh, before I got into my content, I want to talk a little bit about myself, about my time here at Georgia Tech. I'm, so, I'm a fourth year AE student. Um, I have absolutely loved space since I was a little kid. Um, I actually would skip school when I was younger to go watch these space shuttle launches. Uh, I was in Orlando, so I could actually see them from my house. And the fact that I'm now working and it's going to be in space and able to present to it, it means the world to me. Uh, so thank you for allowing me the platform to talk about it. And thank you to the Georgia Tech AE school for allowing me uh, to blossom. And I've done a lot of different work at the GTAE school. I've done research in uh, commercial airline safety. I've done research into drone delivery stations. I've done research at the electric propulsion lab. And now I finally settled in the space system design lab. Even though it's only been two months, I'm very proud of the work that I've been able to do, everything that I've learned, and I'm very excited about uh, what this work holds in the future. So that being said, I'm going to jump into my content. Uh, today I'll be talking about software defined radio, as well as the pos position fix mechanism for ORCA2. Um, what exactly is ORCA2? What is it trying to achieve? Um, so the primary goal for ORCA2 is to improve our models and our simulated environment. And it's going to do this through the use of optically calibrated panels as well as corner cube brush reflectors. And you can actually see in the top right, uh, that is a CAD image of ORCA2. And you can see those brightly colored panels. Those are those calibrated panels. Um, so the way that's going to work is that once ORCA is in orbit, it's going to be able to be detected um, by ground stations and by telescopes. And well, what the information we gain from that, we're going to compare it to our uh, models, finding the discrepancies between reality and the models, and then we'll be able to better these said models. And by bettering our understanding and our models, uh, that's going to lead to better uh, initial orbit determination, uh, atmospheric modeling, as well as refraction modeling, and then low light and motion detecting, detection will all be bettered uh, with, by these models. And then you can see the bottom right, uh, that is the GT Sort telescope, uh, one of the telescopes that would be used uh, to track ORCA. Um, so, ORCA-2 is the specific spacecraft that we will be using uh, to accomplish this mission. And ORCA-2 is actually the success successor to ORCA-1. Um, so ORCA-1 was uh, a mission of these similar uh, objectives. However, it was a very different spacecraft. Um, so ORCA-1 did have those same calibrated panels and it had those retroflectors, but that's actually it. Uh, it did not have an active payload. It was a free tumbler, meaning that once it was pushed out into space, uh, it was more or less on its own. And unfortunately, ORCA-1 was never spotted by a Georgia Tech uh, ground station. Uh, so we have not been able to gain any useful information or data from that spacecraft. So ORCA-2 hopes to give the same data and information 
uh, but through a much more complex and robust spacecraft uh, that's going to be easier to find. Uh, so this new 12U CubeSat is going to contain uh, those same panels and metro reflectors, but it's also going to have uh, a new SSDL design power board. If you look at the image, you can actually see these solar panels on the side of uh, the spacecraft. Those are all going to integrate with our power board. We're very excited about that. It's going to have attitude determination and control systems. So with devices like a sun sensor, uh, magnet torquers, and reaction wheels, that's going to allow it to um, orient itself so that way it can send signals and receive solar power. It's going to have a radiation experiment on board. And it's also going to have an experimental position fix mechanism. And the reason that is in a red box is because that is what I've been working on and what I will be focusing on today for my presentation. Uh, and it should be noted, this is set to launch uh, this summer. Uh, so once again, the fact that I'm actually able to contribute to a project that's going to be in space uh, is still kind of mind blowing. Um, so going into position fix, and what I mean by position fix is this is a spacecraft's ability to determine uh, where exactly it is in space. And the way it typically does this is through the use of a global navigation satellite system. Uh, so uh, I'll get more into how that exactly works later. Um, but essentially, we're going to be receiving these signals uh, from uh, GNSS satellites, such as GPS. And then we're going to take that position fix information, uh, beacon it back down to Earth, and that way we'll be able to more easily locate it and point our telescopes uh, towards the optically calibrated panels retroflectors. Um, and you can see in the bottom right, uh, this is another uh, great CAD image of ORCA-2. Uh, and as you can see, it's a rather complex spacecraft. Uh, I made some of the walls transparent so you can actually see what the insides look like. Uh, and there are individuals working on all different components of this but my work can be boiled down to this circle. Um, and even though that doesn't seem like a lot, uh, that circle shows the onboard antenna, and that antenna is going to be transmitting the data to allow us to obtain a position. Um, so uh, in terms of providing uh, position fixes in the past with past Georgia Tech CubeSats, as I mentioned, Orca 1 didn't have that mechanism. It had no avionics at all. Um, but with past CubeSats, we've used commercially bought position fix mechanisms. I like the one you see on the right. Um, and these are very accurate, and they work to um, a high degree. However, uh, they're very expensive, and they can be difficult to integrate with our systems. Uh, so we wanted to change that up. We wanted to find uh, components that were going to be readily available, uh, cheap, uh, and easy to buy and assemble. Uh, and also, we wanted to make sure that it was easy to interface uh, with our devices, make sure that no matter what the uh, mission goals are, we're able to modify the components and interface it with our satellite. So the new mechanism uh, is envisioned to be lower cost, replicable and easy to interface with. And I want to stress the replicable uh, because if we have a future CubeSat mission with a fast turnaround time, it's important that we can go and get these components, assemble them, and integrate them as quickly as possible. Um, so now talking about the actual components that will be on our position fix mechanism, uh, we have two of our more complex components. Um, we have uh, the Hack RF and the Beagle Bone. And I should start by saying um, a large part of my research this semester has actually been uh, just doing research into these components for the device, understanding exactly what it is they do, and trying to figure out the best RK scenario in terms of cost, um, volume, and complexity. Um, so this is a large part of what I've been doing. We're getting back to it. Uh, the Hack RF one is a software-defined radio, or an SDR. Uh, what an SDR is, essentially, it's a radio that has taken uh, typically physical parts, uh, such as mixers and filters, and it's turned them into embedded software, uh, which makes it much easier to handle, easier to interface with, and easier to modify. It makes it an overall simple device. As you can see on the top right, it is not a very complex device. It has only a couple of ports, so it's very easy to integrate it within our system. Um, and this will operate as the radio of the system. Um, it'll basically be receiving signals from the GPS antenna, and it'll be decoding them into GPS messages. And then it'll send those GPS messages uh, to the system computer, which in this case is going to be the BeagleBone Black. Um, so a BeagleBone Black is essentially a low-power, open-source, a single-board computer that runs Linux. Um, so similar to an Arduino or to a Raspberry Pi, however, with a lot more serial inputs and outputs, um, so it's essentially a small Linux machine, and this is going to be used uh, to decode these GPS messages and actually determine the position fix. Um, so going into the next components, uh, these are more of our simple components. Um, we have the ceramic patch antenna. Uh, you saw how that's going to be on the outside of the spacecraft receiving signals. Um, we have our temperature compensated crystal oscillator, which is a very interesting component. Um, essentially what this does is it provides a very stable electric signal output, and we use that signal output to keep track of time. Uh, so it is essentially our onboard clock, and that's very important for the use of a position fix, and I'll talk about that later. Um, and then our final part, uh, we have the L1 bandpass filter and a bias D both rolled into a single part, which you can see in the bottom. Uh, the L1 bandpass filter allows us to send signals from the antenna uh, to the hack RF and allows us to um, filter those signals down to get rid of any noise. And also the bias T allows us to provide external power uh, to the antenna to give it uh, an extra gain. Uh, so that might allow us to provide a position fix uh, more quickly. Those are our components. 
Um, as I mentioned, the most important part about this project is reducing cost. So here I've shown the cost of everything. And Hackard Ref is by far the most expensive component. However, it is still in the range of hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. Um, so this combined leads to a price of less than $550, um, which means that if we are proud of our work, if we think it works well, and we want to make a new cube set, uh, we can get all of this uh, very easily um, from any, there's a number of online distributors for all of these parts, uh, and we can get it for less than $550. So, very excited about that number. Um, this is the full assembly. Um, it's not the most impressive looking thing. Uh, however, let me throw some labels on there. Um, so we have all the parts that were just mentioned. Um, I will say that in this particular setup, the beagle in black is being used not as the computer, but simply as a uh, power output to the oscillator. In this case, my MacBook is actually uh, the onboard computer, um, but that will be fixed shortly. Um, obviously, my Mac cannot be in orbit, um, so we will make sure uh, that beagle, beagle bone black is running the proper software and able to integrate with the entire system. Also, I wanted to make a note uh, that if you are messing with random electronics in the middle of a public place like Harrison Square, you will get strange looks. And that is something that I now know for a fact. Um, so that is the setup, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the software. Um, so the software that we needed was something that was going to take these GPS messages and turn them into a position in terms of latitude, longitude, and elevation. Um, the software we found to do that is GNSS SDL, or the Global uh, Navigation Satellite System Software Defined Receiver. And it's receiver instead of radio, that's just the way this company prefers it. Um, but this is really a fantastic software. I can't speak highly enough about it. Um, it's open source. It's compatible with a wider range of computers. It has this fantastic uh, monitor, which you can see in the bottom right, where it shows you in real time uh, your position as well as the satellites that you're connected to. Um, so in essence, what this is doing is it's taking those GPS messages from satellites. It's using the time transmitted by those satellites and comparing it with the time that we have on board. It's differencing those times to provide pseudo ranges. Uh, and then we're using those pseudo ranges to establish a position. Um, so a very typical GPS a procedure. However, that's what this software is all doing, and this will all be operating on the Linux. And the last thing I'll say about GNSS SDR uh, is that it uses a single configuration file. Uh, so once you have it all properly installed, you can modify it in terms of the voltage being output. You can modify it in terms of your initial starting location. There are all these modif modifications you can make uh, based off one configuration file, which makes the whole process a lot easier. Um, and then talking about our specific configuration and testing that we've done. Um, so in our current configuration, we are streaming in live data from the antenna and the HackRF directly to uh, the system running GNSS SDR, um, which will be the same case as when we're in orbit. Um, we're assuming an antenna location right now just to make the position faster. It gives us a good initial guess. Um, we're not going to be doing that when it's in orbit. Uh, we're going to take a guess at where it could be in orbit based off overall elements and what we know about the launch vehicle. And then we're going to try to establish a good initial guess for that to try to make the position fix as efficient as possible. And then finally, um, right now we're transmitting the data to a monitor. Uh, just for debugging purposes, but obviously we're going to save that processing power when we're in orbit because there will be nobody to check that monitor. Uh, so with these recent tests that I've been doing in Harrison Square, um, we've gotten a position fix in 4.5 minutes, um, which is honestly pretty good. We believe that number will actually get better when we're in orbit uh, because we're going to have less interference from things like the atmosphere, uh, clouds, tree branches hanging over my head. Uh, and additionally, when you're in orbit, you have more direct lines of sight to other satellites since you're actually above the atmosphere. Um, so that is our current number. We think it will be better, and we're going to do extensive testing over the next couple of weeks to try to get it as low as possible. Um, so speaking of this future testing, uh, we're going to make sure we try out a couple of different software configurations, uh, mainly looking into uh, sending different voltage biases to the antenna, and potentially bypassing the hack, not hack, uh, by bypassing the bias T altogether. And that's what the bias T does. It provides that extra voltage. However, if we can do that with the software through the hack RF and save the space that the bias T takes up, uh, then that would be fantastic. Um, so in terms of hardware configurations, as I just mentioned, testing with and without the bias T, um, make sure we run it with the BeagleBone Black as the main computer, as it will be in orbit. Uh, and then finally, we want to test our new system against old and proven hardware, uh, typically more expensive hardware. And that image on the right is actually uh, an old oscillator. Uh, so we want to test it against that and see the differences we're getting and make sure that we are getting an accurate enough position fix uh, to move forward with this uh, mechanism. And then finally, we want to check it out against the GPS simulator. What this does is it sends actual um, GPS signals into the hacker app that simulate uh, an object in orbit. Uh, and then we can see if our position fix lines up with what the system is saying we should be receiving. That way we know that in a space environment, uh, the hard hardware and software actually uh, correspond together and match what we should be getting. Um, so some next steps that we need to take. Um, the most important, and I've said this a number of times already, but we need to get this running on the Beagle Belt. Uh, this is the computer that will be on the spacecraft. It's essentially that we make sure that we can run it from that operating device. Um, we need to do extensive testing in terms of all the different configurations I just mentioned. We want to investigate potentially using uh, this same system to obtain a Doppler shift measurements, 
which would allow us to provide uh, relative velocities. Drone has to be amazing. Uh, GNSS SDR claims that you can do that with their software. If we could get velocity measurements um, with the same mechanism for no additional cost, that would be a huge plus. We want to integrate it onto Orca, so in a couple of weeks we'll actually be putting together the satellite, and I will be make sure I will make sure this is integrated properly into the physical portion of the of the CubeSat, which is going to be a very exciting time. And then finally, um, once the mission is in flight, we want to make sure we're now analyzing the parts and looking at potential backups, potential substitutes that we could use in the future, either by building them from scratch or by finding them in the market. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, I want to say uh, thank you for my one audience member. Um, thank you to Dr. Gunter and the entire ORCA team. Uh, I appreciate your mentorship and your friendship. Uh, they've really opened me, welcomed me in with open arms, and I can't tell them how much I appreciate it. Uh, so, yeah, do you have any questions? And roar, roaring applause. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually do have questions. So, it's about four points. Mm -hmm. is, uh, your station seven, right, Harrison Square, mm -hmm. and that bunch of experiments with Thompson. Those are the kinds of things that affect that time, right? Mm -hmm. Find your location. Yeah, it is. Because when you actually run the software, um, you'll see it'll be like connected to one satellite, connected to two satellites, and you can actually kind of tell like when a satellite passes behind a building or something, uh, because then you get a loss of loss signal. Um, and you need you need the software usually takes five or six satellites where it actually starts providing uh, position data, because um, that's just a, a GPS restraint. You need a number of satellites to be able to determine where you're going. Um, is four and a half minutes like a good amount of time? Is that a slow amount of time? Do you know where that lies in terms of? So we've seen other mechanisms that get it um, in, a lot, in a lot faster time using these same setups. So we just wanted to try to mess with the software to see if we could get that down closer to like the 30 second to minute range. However, um, for the application, there's not a hard time limit on when we need a position fixed by. Um, because within the realm of minutes, it's still going to be fine for us to figure out um, where it is in space. So I don't believe that that's going to be a huge problem if five minutes is what we are able to come up with. But I, I really do believe we're going to be able to get it down into the one or two minutes. And you run it on your Mac, right? Yes. Um, do you think well, the legal one is the most stripped down to you, correct? Mm -hmm. In that sense, do you think it'll be easier or more difficult? So the reason I did my MacBook first is just because I'm very new to all of this. Yeah. Um, my previous research has always has almost always been hardware. Um, so I'm new to the software world, which is why I was really on that book and I thought I would do that first and I thought it'd be easier. Um, I actually think getting it working in DeagleBone, once I have an understanding of how DeagleBone works, might be easier. And just because this system is more designed for Linux than it is for MacBooks. And even though the two are relatively similar, uh, there's just a lot more tutorials out there in terms of getting it working on a Linux system. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to, I'm not going wood or something, um, but I, I don't think it'll be uh, more difficult than it was to get it on. So yes, so the entire Orca 2 mission will be flying in the summer. I'm not allowed to give a specific um, okay. launch date, um, but summer. yes, this summer. Yeah, right. yeah, right. That, I got the opportunity to work on a project. Like, yeah, it'll be be flying in the summer. I'm like, you're you're choking. I'm I'm not ready for this, but oh yeah, it's it's been very exciting. Did that last part again? Like, oh, you said ride share. Yeah. Okay. Um, to be entirely honest with you, I'm not super aware. I mean, I'm also, I want to be very careful because I don't know what I can and can't say. Um, I'll just say I've been very focused in on this specific mechanism. Um, I've not been super involved in terms of the, um, the overall handling of the mission. That's, those are the team leads. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I can't give a whole lot of information on that. I appreciate the questions. Those are questions. Uh, I'm going to check the chat, make sure there's no questions in there. I don't know if there's anyone even here. All right, I'm getting off with no questions. All right, I'm going to close this out. Yep. Sounds good. Oh, is anyone listening online? Thank you. <laughs>